Good afternoon and welcome back to Downing Street for the daily coronavirus briefing. And I'm delighted to be joined by Baroness Dido Harding, the Executive Chair of NHS Test and Trace. Before we turn to Test and Trace, uh, let's go through the daily slides. If we have the first slide, please. This slide shows uh, testing and the number of new confirmed cases of coronavirus. And the figures show that as of yesterday, there were 197,007 tests, uh, bringing the total number of tests that have been uh, done in this country to 6 million, more than 6,240,000. And the number of confirmed cases as of yesterday was 1,266, bringing the total number of confirmed positive test results to 291,409 and you can see that despite the vast increase in the number of tests that have been carried out the number of positive cases continues to fall and has been falling on that seven day rolling average uh, a little bit up from the from the very low figure yesterday of, of 1,003 uh, but nevertheless continuing overall uh, to fall. Next slide, please. This matches the data from hospitals, which shows that the number of new admissions with COVID-19, excluding Scotland, uh, it was 462 on the 8th of June, and this is down from 658 a week earlier on the 1st of June, and down from a peak of over 3,000 in late March. Likewise, the number of those people on ventilator beds, mechanical ventilators, is down to 440, down from 604 a week ago. And again, uh, that was over 3,000 at the peak. So it's very good progress to see both of those numbers continuing to fall uh, over, over, over recent days. If we turn now to the next slide, which shows the regional breakdown, um, again, as it has throughout this crisis, this shows that the shape is, is, is broadly the same in most regions of the country, uh, and the downward trend persists everywhere, uh, which is obviously very good news. If we turn now to the, uh, the number of deaths, the final slide, um, the, uh, the latest figures show that yesterday 151 people died with coronavirus, that's the reported number, bringing the total to 41,279. Again, we can see this downward trend continues to come down. And in fact, the number of deaths over the past week is the lowest since the week ending on the 28th of March. And this is good progress, but clearly, clearly there is more to do. And it, it, these data show that this virus is in retreat and it's in summary we're working through our plan and the plan is working and that means that we're able to restore some of the freedoms that people hold so dear and from the beginning of lockdown the challenge has been not just how to get the virus under control but how then to be able to ease the lockdown measures. And I'm, I was really delighted by the announcements that the Prime Minister was able to make yesterday, allowing these bubbles uh, so that single parents or uh, those who live alone will be able to form a support bubble with one other household. And I, th I think this is a big step forward and it, it, it's very difficult uh, to... Um, to imagine the impact if you haven't lived on your own for 12 weeks. Um, and so I'm really pleased that we've been able to restore that human contact uh, and the support that so many have been missing. And I know that the Prime Minister's announcement has given such hope and comfort to so many. And uh, I'm really pleased at the very positive reception uh, that it's got. And um, to help us take more measures to come out of lockdown. Of course, the Prime Minister tasked Dido and I with delivering a test and trace system. Testing for the virus and tracing how it spreads is critical to containing it locally so that we can ease the national lockdown. And it's by is isolating the virus 
that we can control it and we can stop it spreading through our communities. In this plan to lift lockdown, test and trace is our radar, if you like. It helps us identify where the virus is and trace how it's spreading through the community. And you have your part to play. If you have symptoms, you must immediately self-isolate and get a test. It's easy to get a test on nhs.uk or by dialing 119. If you test positive, you must work with NHS Test and Trace to identify who you've been in close contact with. And if you're asked by NHS Test and Trace to isolate, you must do so to break the chain of transmission and to stop the spread of the virus. I would even go as to, so far as to say that participation with NHS Test and Trace is your civic duty. Please do it to protect your loved ones, do it to protect your community, do it to protect the nation, and do it to protect the NHS. Today we're able to publish some of the initial statistics about the first week of operation of NHS Test and Trace. Uh, Baroness Harding will take us through these figures in a moment, but I just wanted to put them in a bit of context. They paint a positive picture. As we will see when we go through the figures, firstly remember that they represent just the first seven days of this service, and yet it's already had a huge impact. The system is working well, and as we've both said from the start, we will keep improving it. It will keep getting better, and I think you'll see from these figures why we are confident that it will be world class. And I'm also delighted to say that we still have spare capacity, and long may it remain so. This is a good thing. It's a sign of the team's success. And I just want to take this moment before I hand over, very formally, on behalf of us all, to thank Dido and her team, to thank the Army of Contact Tracers, thank you, to thank the NHS and Public Health England, who are playing such an important role, to thank the private companies without whom this would be impossible, including Boots and Amazon and Serco and CTEL. And finally, I want to thank you for your participation. It is brilliant that the vast majority of people have done their civic duty. And as we work through our plan, and as we keep driving this virus down, let us maintain that spirit and fortitude that has helped us throughout this pandemic. And that, of course, includes not attending large gatherings, including demonstrations of more than six people. Now, I understand that people want to show their passion for a cause that they care deeply about. But this is a virus that thrives on social contact, regardless of what your cause may be. So please, for the safety of your loved ones, stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. I'm now going to hand over to Baroness Harding to take us all through the test and trace statistics. Dario. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, if I can have the final slide, please. As the figures in the top half show, in the first week of the programme, 8,117 people who had tested positive for coronavirus had their details transferred to the contact tracing system. Of those, 5,407 people, that's 67% of the total, provided us with the details of their recent close contacts. And it's very encouraging that over 75% gave us this information within 24 hours of being asked to do so. We really appreciate and recognise everyone's swift response. Using that information, as you can see in the bottom half of the slide, we were able to identify 31,794 people who had been in close contact with someone who tested positive. Of these, 26,985 people were advised and agreed to self-isolate, which is 85% of all total contacts identified. Again, this was done speedily and timely. Given that it is still very early days, this is really encouraging. It means that the vast majority of people are responding positively and willingly, sharing information and self-isolating when needed. 
27,000 people who otherwise may not have known that they and their families and communities were at risk are now safely at home. I want to say thank you to all of you who've got a test, who've given us a list of your recent contacts, and to everyone who has responded and agreed to self-isolate. NHS Test and Trace is a service for the public that works best as a partnership with the public. And our first week of data shows that this partnership has got off to a good start. But together we know there are further improvements we can make to the system. The data shows that 4,807 of the contacts we identified didn't confirm to us that they would self-isolate. This doesn't necessarily mean that these people aren't self-isolating. Some of them we've been unable to reach. Some of the people in this category will have already been told by their friends to self-isolate, and only a small minority don't want to self-isolate. And we, we need to understand why this is and what we can do to support them to stay at home. I don't underestimate how tough this is for some of us, and we're working hard to support you, whether from local authorities, the National Volunteering Service, and through access to benefits such as statutory sick pay. And I want to reiterate what the Secretary of State have just said. If you have symptoms, a fever, persistent cough, or new loss or change in sense of taste and smell, testing is freely available. You can and must book yourself a test. If one of your children, for example, has a fever, stay at home and order a test. If NHS Test and Trace gets in touch with you to say you've tested positive, you should go online or call us if that's easier and provide us with accurate, up-to-date information about your recent close contacts. And if you're one of those contacts, it is vitally important that you do what the vast majority of people are already doing and agree to self-isolate. Because in doing so, you will be taking the virus out of circulation, protecting your friends, your family, and the wider community from infection. So to summarise, the system is working well at scale. We are reaching the majority of people testing positive, and you are trusting in us providing us with your contacts and isolating when asked. We will keep learning, improving and refining, but I'm confident that together we are building a high-quality service on which all of us can depend. Thank you very much, Dido. So we'll first go to questions from the public, and then we'll go to questions from the media. So firstly, from the public, we have a video by video, Andy from Bromsgrove. Andy. Hello. As businesses plan to reopen in the coming months, can the government give any assurances to any further financial support if track and trace handlers request employees to self-isolate and hamper their ability to open and operate? If one employee is tested positive, does that mean that the entire workforce that has had contact with that person needs to self-isolate? For smaller companies, this could be potentially devastating having to close for 14 days with no employees to operate within them. Thanks, Andy. Those are incredibly good questions. And I'm going to have a stab, and then I'm sure that Baroness Harding will want to uh, explain more. And the central point I'd say is that we have put in a financial support package, uh, both, of course, for businesses and for those who need to isolate. And um, if you have close contacts and somebody tests positive, then those close contacts will have to isolate. But as a business, you can mitigate this by ensuring that you have a COVID secure workplace. So if you follow the COVID secure guidelines that the government has published for how businesses can operate in a way that is safe and doesn't pass on the disease, then those guidelines are consistent with what you have to do to ensure that you don't have to isolate if somebody in the business tests positive. So by being COVID secure at work, that helps to ensure that fewer people will have to isolate if one of the team tests positive. And the link between the two for small businesses, I totally understand, it's incredibly important. But the most important message is that if you are asked to isolate by NHS Test and Trace, then you must, because the worst thing for everybody is to spread this disease. Maybe just to add, 
Uh, close contact means being within two metres of someone for 15 minutes or more, um, and, and or being in very close contact, um, less than a metre. So provided we are all socially distancing at work and um, using good hand hygiene, actually you won't be a close contact with your work colleagues. Now, I appreciate that that isn't possible 100% of the time. If you're wearing personal protective equipment uh, correctly, that isn't a close contact. Um, and a number, in a number of roles, people are forming fixed teams where a subset of the business are working closely together and they will be close contacts. So there are a number of things that all employers and all of us as individuals can do that will also help stamp out the virus and have the added benefit of not meaning that we have to go into 14 days of isolation. Uh, thanks, Dido. Uh, that guidance for businesses is available on the gov.uk website. It's really important because by following that guidance, you'll reduce the likelihood that exactly as you say, Andy, the whole team might have to go off and isolate. And it's one of the reasons, for instance, why Dido and I are standing more than two metres apart uh, here, because this is not close contact because we're far enough apart. Um, the next question is text on the screen, and it's from Katie from Preston. Katie from Preston asks, as a parent of a child with significant additional needs, the lockdown has had an impact on the support network that we and many other families rely upon. Can you tell me how this could be reflected in any changes made to social bubbles? Well, thank you, Katie. This is a really, really important question. And we don't underestimate the impact that the lockdown has had on families in your situation. And one of the reasons that we made the decision to make the change and introduce the social bubbles that the Prime Minister was able to announce yesterday is because that way, without having uh, much of an impact on the spread of the disease, we could uh, give some relief to some of those who are in the most difficult circumstances people living alone, for whom we know that the lockdown has had a particularly significant impact, especially on, on mental health, and for lone parents who really, really need that support. Now, I appreciate that if you're a, if you're a parent but not a lone parent uh, with a child with significant additional needs, then I absolutely appreciate how you'll need more support too, and you're at top of mind when we come to what further measures we can take. And of course, the more successful the test and trace scheme is, the more we'll, we'll safely be able to relieve other lockdown measures. That is, the, that is the, absolutely at the core of the plan. So thank you very much for your question, and I wish you the very best of luck in, for the rest of the lockdown, and I hope that we can, we, can, uh, we can bring relief to you as soon as possible. If we now turn to questions from the media, First question from Hugh Pym of the BBC. Hugh. Thank you very much. As you've explained, uh, a majority of people that tested positive, you did get contact details from. Are you a bit concerned that with one third of people who tested positive, for whatever reason, you couldn't get details of recent contacts from? Well, I would say that I think that the system has worked well and to get two-thirds in the first week of operation, it, it beat my expectations. And uh, then to have the vast majority, 85% of the contacts that were given, self-isolating, that beat my expectations too. And this system gets better and better. But Dido will be able... So I think Dido did a, and her team did a brilliant job in the first week, and she can give you the answer of what we're doing to, to try to get those numbers up. Yeah, I, mean, I think for the first week of a scale citizen service, um, this is good performance, and, and clearly it can and needs to and will get better. Um, if you look at why we haven't got 100% of people's um, uh, close contacts, some of it is, uh, we all have a part to play in this, which is when we take a test, making sure that we give the right contact details for ourselves, so it's easier for the test and trace team to contact you. Um, some of it is us um, learning when's most convenient to reach people. 
Um, so we contact people 10 times during a 24-hour period, and over the course of the last two weeks, we've already been testing and learning and improving, and we'll continue to do that to find what times of day and what means are easiest to, to reach people. So, Hugh, I think for, for the beginning of this service, the feedback from people testing positive and from contacts is that they are pleased with the service NHS Test and Trace is providing. Um, can we do better? Yes, of course we can, and, and we'll continue to work at it. Of course, go ahead. There was a time when you said the smartphone app would play a crucial role with testing and tracing. What's the situation with the app right now? Well, as we've repeatedly said, the, the app uh, will help and we'll bring it in when it's right to do so. And as we launched NHS Test and Trace, we were clear we want to embed this system and get confidence that people are following the advice that's given by human beings before introducing the technological element, and that remains the case. Thanks, Hugh. Next question, Tom Clark from ITV. Hi, Tom. Hi, Secretary of State. Thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I think it's fair to say, listening to the answers to Hugh's, Hugh's question, test and trace is not yet the world-beating system that the Prime Minister promised. We've still got 1,200 new cases of the virus each day. Isn't another significant easing of lockdown on Monday a very dangerous step for both health and the economy? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, and um, the first thing I'd say is I have confidence and renewed confidence with these statistics that we will get a world-class system. The Prime Minister promised that we would have the system up and running on the 1st of June, and we delivered ahead of that uh, commitment in at the end of May and he promised that we will have a world-class system and we will we clearly are building and improving all of the time and uh, we've been incredibly frank about the fact that this system is going to uh, going to get better and better um, it, and you can see that it started in a in a pretty good shape uh, but of course it has to get better and better the link towards the uh, to the lockdown measures is important too because the better test and trace is so the, the more lockdown measures we can relieve safely. But I'm confident that the measures that we've announced to be able to relieve on, uh, on Saturday for the social measures, on, on Monday for the retail measures, they are safe, they're part of the plan, we're working through our plan, we're sticking with that plan, and the plan is clearly working. We're, we're coming th out of lockdown carefully, and safely and I think you've seen this week that we're prepared to take decisions in a cautious way in a careful way to make sure that we do it in a way that is safe and the good news is that the surveys show uh, that the incidence of the disease continues to fall and that gives us confidence that the plan is working and we're able to make these steps the steps that we've announced and confirmed in a safe and secure way. Thank you. One very quick follow-up, if I may. One of the key measures to how efficient test and trace may work is the speed it takes for someone who has symptoms to get tested and get a result, and for that result to get to the testing and trace system. Uh, so far, the government has not made available the data that those of us outside of government need to understand how fast that testing system is working. When will you make that data available so that we can actually figure out how efficient the system is? I'll ask Dido to take that question. I'm happy to pick that up. So today we've published the time it takes from the point of identifying a contact to that contact uh, committing to self-isolate. And you can see that 75% that or more um, are doing that within 24 hours. You're quite right that we haven't yet published the turnaround time for testing and therefore the whole end-to-end -end turnaround time. We're working hand-in-hand -hand with the UK Statistics Authority to make sure that what we produce is verified data. And I know it's tempting to believe that it should be really, really easy just to give you all that data and, and it just be instantly right. But in order to, to join up the point at which you order a test all the way through to, to mapping your contacts, we've got literally hundreds of different laboratories across the country and um, several hundred different points of testing. And the data needs to be good enough 
for us all to draw meaningful conclusions from it. So our commitment is that we will publish that data as soon as we and the UK Statistics Authority are confident that we can draw sensible conclusions from it. Um, we aim to do that as quick as possible over the next few weeks, if, if at all possible, both at a national level and then ultimately at a local level as well. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, next question is from Andy Bell from Channel 5. Thank you. Um, it's clear that there are still thousands of people apparently not cooperating with the system for whatever reason. Are you ruling out any kind of enforcement uh, mechanism to try and make this work better? We're not ruling it out, Andy, but we don't think we need it at the moment. And what we've got to do is keep seeing those numbers uh, go up, uh, the, the numbers of people in the system and the proportion that we get to, uh, because we think that is the best way forward. Could I just add that actually the thing that I most want to encourage is people to get a test. Um, the, the proportion of people who are at risk of infection that we can self-isolate is in the end dependent on people who are infectious getting a test. And so actually we want to encourage everyone to feel safe and confident that they should get a test if they have symptoms. Um, and making sure that we bring as many people as possible who, who have got coronavirus into the test and trace programme is actually the number one thing we need to improve over the next coming weeks. And if you look at the other end, the fact that 85% of people who are being called by NHS test and trace as contacts are agreeing to self-isolate within 24 hours shows that the vast majority of the population is not only just willing to comply but really sees the importance of this service and are taking it really seriously. We've had some wonderful reactions from people saying thank you so much for calling me I was about to go to a family barbecue but now I'm not because I don't want to infect my family. Thank you. Can I have, um, yes of course go ahead Andy. Yeah yeah thank you um, and just following up on that slightly which is that those people who are then contacted and told to isolate but they're not told to get a test or they're not tested automatically you've just said secretary of state that there is more capacity would it not make sense to not only say right you have to isolate but to make sure those people are also getting a test well we've looked into exactly that andy and taken uh, clinical advice on it and the clinical advice is that because this virus can incubate sometimes for quite a long time up to 14 days if you got a test it might give you a negative result, but you still are incubating the virus and come out with it later. So the clinical advice is really clear in that if, even if somebody was tested in that period, they'd still have to isolate for the full 14 days because of the way that this virus incubates inside our bodies. So that is unfortunately a matter of biology that has led to taking that decision. It's not about testing capacity. Thanks, Andy. Next question is from Laura Hughes of the FT. Laura. You have rolled out antibody testing for NHS workers. Can I ask what you've discovered through those antibody tests? Are there people who are finding out that they actually had coronavirus but didn't experience any symptoms? And if there are people who are getting this virus and not experiencing symptoms, how does that hamper the test and trace approach? Because clearly people aren't going to go and get a test yeah. or report themselves yeah. if they're not feeling anything different. So the answer, um, I'll ask Dido to come in with the details, but the big picture answer, Laura, is yes, there are some people who uh, don't have uh, symptoms but do have the virus. And in fact, in the ONS study, we find that around 70 to 80% of people who test positive don't have symptoms. So that is quite a significant finding and one of the important things about this disease in the same way that asymptomatic transmission is one of the things that makes controlling this disease uh, really hard and is novel for any coronavirus and is part of this, uh, one of the things that makes it so difficult. Um, and, um, the, but there is a solution to the problem that that raises, which is that the more people who do have symptoms, who we get into the NHS test and trace scheme, the more contacts we, we manage to isolate, so that whether they have symptoms or not, they are isolating for the period in which they would be infectious, and that breaks the chain of transmission. So precisely because of the nature of this virus, 
that you can have it without symptoms and still pass it on even without knowing you've had it, that's why the 14-day isolation is so important to break the spread of the disease. Dido. Just add the other thing that we are doing is in both the NHS and in social care, we are now routinely testing staff um, to see if they have the virus, uh, the, the swab tests, as opposed to the antibody tests you refer to. Um, so you, it, there we're looking to find people who have the virus but don't have any symptoms. And as the Prime Minister confirmed yesterday, we are also now rolling that approach out to other high-risk, high-contact professions, like people who, who spend significant amount of time in an enclosed space with a large number of people, so taxi drivers, security guards. Um, and, and there, I think, we, we need to get better at hunting out the virus, both as individuals, if we have the symptoms, getting a test, and then NHS Test and Trace needs to get better at targeting our testing in communities and professions where there are likely to be more people who have the disease but aren't showing symptoms. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, can I just, I mean, is there an update on when more members of the public are going to be able to get these antibody tests? Because clearly lots of people are going to want to know if, if they've had it. Dido. Um, yes, I think one of the challenges, and I know we all want it to be true, that if we have antibodies, it will then mean that we're free to do things that others are not. But at the moment, the science on antibodies, if we have an antibody test, what it tells you is that you, you have antibodies. Over time, we would expect that we will build up the evidence to demonstrate what proportion or level of antibodies you need to actually have Im immunity and for how long you would have immunity. But at the moment, the science isn't there. So I totally understand everybody's desire to know if that cough or temperature they had in February or March was in fact coronavirus. But at the moment, it won't tell you anything other than you did or didn't have it. So um, it, it's, it, it will come in time and the, the testing that we're doing, um, antibody testing in health and care at the moment is enabling us to build up that scientific evidence base to the point at which then we will start to see the real benefit for all of us. If you're, if you're called and um, you're asked to participate in one of these trials, like the one Dido's just described, to find out the link from having antibodies to whether you uh, are then immune, um, if you're a member of the public, then you, please do take part in those trials. And so far, we've had a very, very positive response to people being asked to participate in these trials. But they really are important because they increase our understanding of the virus and therefore understand, increase our understanding of what safely can be done to lift lockdown measures, get the country back on its feet whilst also suppressing the virus. Thanks, Laura. Next question is from Mesa Hall of the Daily Express. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, if I can ask Baroness Harding, um, the people who are refusing to comply with self-isolation, uh, what, what sort of reasons are they given for, for not doing so? Are your contract tracers trained to persuade them that it is their civic duty? And should these people frankly feel ashamed that they're not doing their bit to, to help fight this disease? And um, Secretary of State, if I could stray on to the issue of racism that's been dominating uh, the news this week. Um, a number of Labour MPs have written to the Home Secretary today to express dismay at her talking about her own heritage and her own personal experience of racism. Is she wrong to speak out in this way? Dido. Well, so just um, to explain, the 4,807 contacts um, who have not confirmed that they will self-isolate, a significant proportion of them we haven't reached yet and spoken to or, or been able to get a response from them. So I don't think we should um, leap to the conclusion that all of them, all 15% of contacts, are actively choosing not to self-isolate. Some simply won't have replied to the text message or the email or we had the wrong email or text or number for them. So no, I think it's a, we were, are overstating the number of people who are actively choosing to ignore the advice. Um, and I think, no, in the end, um, it, all of us, it's incumbent on all of us to sort of think carefully about what we're doing to protect our loved ones, our local community. And what's really encouraging is the vast majority of people are doing that. And I think we should focus on that um, and sort of hold the mirror up to ourselves on how we would behave when we get that phone call or text message, because our communities will be depending on us doing the right thing. 
And on your question about um, Priti Patel, Mesa, um, I, I think that, of course, Priti Patel was not wrong to talk of her personal experiences of, of racism. And I, I've seen this letter, and, and I abhor this divisive identity politics that's being levelled at Priti Patel. I'm incredibly proud to be part of the most diverse government in history. I'm very proud to be part of that with Priti and Rishi and Alok and Nadim and Kemi and Ranil and James and Suella and all the rest. And we don't think that there's such a thing as the wrong type of BME. We think that people are equal. And that's what we need to see as a society, everybody seeing others as equal. And I just hope that the debates that are rightly taking place are debates that are all about how we can promote true equality of opportunity and see everybody for the individual that they are. Thanks, Mesa. The final question is from John Walker from the Birmingham Post and the Newcastle Chronicle. John. Thank you. Um, as I understand it, the government's plan is to carefully reduce the lockdown nationally and to ask local councils to contain outbreaks in areas where there's a spike in cases. But councils I've spoken to say they aren't currently in a position to do this. They were asked to produce an outbreak control plan by June the 30th, so those aren't ready yet. And they don't have the legal powers to impose lockdowns locally. It seems the government is still looking at whether they need extra powers. So with shops opening on Monday, it seems that you are easing the national lockdown before the ability to impose local controls is in place. And I wondered if you could explain the thinking behind that. Well, that's, that's not quite the case, John, because we do have powers to, um, to do things locally if we need to take local action to control the, uh, the outbreaks. Um, those powers reside with me as Secretary of State, and we've got a system in place so that local leaders, if they, if they have an outbreak locally, are able to raise concerns um, if they need more action than, uh, than they have in their own uh, powers locally. This link between the local and the national is absolutely critical to getting this right. Uh, Dido, I wonder whether you want to say more because you've been doing so much work on this. Yes, I'd just say that, that this, local authorities across the country and their health protection teams are doing this now. So there are a whole host of people working really hard on the ground to support businesses and other organisations that have got small outbreaks and they're successfully containing them. What we're doing as part of NHS Test and Trace is supporting those local teams, build scale, um, build resources, and as the Secretary of State says, really codifying how they can escalate if they need help and how we make sure that everyone around the country's got the resources they need. That's why the government um, issued £300 million worth of additional funding to local authorities a couple of weeks ago to enable them to build out those local plans. In fact, actually, I was on a call only yesterday, um, chaired by the Mayor of London, with a whole group of stakeholders reviewing the London local containment plan. So actually, I think this work is happening rather like the rest of NHS Test and Trace. It, it will improve over time. Um, um, but the good thing is it's live and operating now. Does that satisfy you, John? Uh, it, it does. Can, can I quickly um, ask an of a uh, small question, Secretary of State, will you publish or ask SAGE to publish the regional R figures that you're using as they seem to be different to the ones that the media have seen and that we've been reporting so far? Yes, this point about the regional R is really, really important to get right. Um, there was, the, there's more than 10 models that feed into SAGE and to their analysis of what R is across the country. And their analysis is that R is below one in all regions. One of those models um, had R um, above one in a couple of regions, but you've got to take all of the different science into account. You've got to look at the direct reporting of what's going on through the ONS surveys as well, which aren't models, that's actually measuring by testing, on you know, boots on the ground, testing people uh, to find out how many uh, are, um, are, are, are positive. And as I say, the incidence of disease, the number of cases is coming down, which is really good. 
The amount of disease that there is in Newcastle and the North East is coming down. The amount of disease that there is in Birmingham and the West Midlands is coming down. And that is testament to the, to the people of this country who are following the rules in the very large part uh, and now we can confirm are doing, what, doing their duty by NHS Test and Trace as well. Thanks very much, John. And that ends today's daily coronavirus briefing. See you again soon.